Hello, I'm Cliff May, FTD's founder and president. Thanks for joining us today. For those of you who may not be familiar with us, FTD is a nonpartisan research institute focused on national security and foreign policy. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's event on consequence-driven cyber-informed engineering, hosted by FTD's Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation. CCTI seeks to advance U.S. prosperity and security through technology innovation while countering cyber threats that seek to diminish it. CCTI promotes a greater understanding within the U.S. government, private sector, and allied countries of the threats and opportunities to national security posed by the rapidly changing and expanding technological environment. Today's event will discuss a vitally important topic, the vulnerabilities posed to America's critical infrastructure. And more importantly, the experts and practitioners with us will discuss well-researched solutions and methods that public utilities and policymakers could implement today to better counter cyber sabotage. The concept of consequence-driven cyber-informed engineering was developed by Andy Bachman and Sarah Freeman, who are both joining us today. A link to their book on this methodology is on the events page. Andy is the senior grid strategist for Idaho National Laboratory's National and Homeland Security Directorate. Sarah is an industrial control systems cybersecurity analyst at Idaho National Laboratory. We also are pleased to have Andrew Hildick Smith joining us. He worked at a large water and wastewater utility for 30 years and is currently the water sector chief for the Boston section of InfraGuard and a principal at OT SEC LLC. Finally, my colleague Samantha Ravitch will moderate today's event. Samantha is chair of FDD's Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation and its transformative cyber innovation lab. She also serves as a commissioner on the congressionally mandated Cyberspace Solarium Commission. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. I encourage you to learn more about FDD and check out our recent events and analysis at fdd.org. You can follow us on Twitter at FDD. I'm now pleased to turn the floor over to Samantha. Hi, uh, we're here to discuss consequence-driven cyber-informed engineering or CCE and the vulnerability of critical infrastructure to disruption by cyber attacks and to congratulate Andy and Sarah on the publication of this great book and I highly recommend it. Um, you know, this topic of uh, the vulnerability of critical infrastructure is finally starting to get the attention of the broader public. Of course, the folks on this panel have been studying this issue for many, many years and how to mitigate um, the problems. But I do wanna reference that though, even the World Economic Forum noted in its 2020 uh, report that cyber attacks on critical infrastructure um, now are rated the fifth top risk to the global economy. So um, let's get into it. Let me first turn to Sarah. Uh, tell us a little bit about the origin of the concept of CCE and how did you come to recognize the challenge facing critical infrastructure and the need for engineering solutions? It's interesting because a lot of what you were just saying there is really speaks to the heart of the origins of CCE. Uh, at Idaho National Laboratory, we spend a lot of time looking at critical infrastructure protection issues. Uh, and much of that is threat informed. So as we've seen more and more examples of advanced attacks against critical infrastructure or even advanced attacks that could be applied to critical infrastructure, it became apparent to the group that there was a disconnect between what defenders thought the attackers were doing and the degree and sophistication skill that they were demonstrating. And that gap between defenders and attackers was something that we were really trying to address with CCE. Great. Um, Andy, now, now that we kind of understand why CCE was conceived in, in the first place, can you tell us how it works and, and what makes it different than traditional forms of cyber defense, which are really focused on patching vulnerabilities, strong firewalls, air gaps, and, and other digital systems? Yeah, sure, sure. And um, just want to say, first of all, it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you guys today. Thanks. Thanks for the sound. Um, yeah, it definitely goes against, I think, a lot of the common wisdom of what uh, the cybersecurity uh, industrial um, uh, 
uh, business has has formed where it, what's formed around it. Uh, it. It looks first to engineering uh, rather than to uh, adding more digital technology on top of what we already have as everybody's modernizing. There's four basic phases to it, but one constant theme throughout uh, throughout each phase is think like an adversary. A colleague of ours, uh, Marty Edwards, who's uh, given talks on CC in the past, uh, coined the phrase, uh, think like an adversary, but act like an engineer. And uh, as you go into the first phase, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail, that can be done on people's own time. But as you go into the first phase, we're, we're trying to identify the comparative of handful of functions and processes in an organization could be an it's an industrial company perhaps could be water could be electricity ONG chemical etc can be the military sometimes too but what are the handful of essential functions and processes that simply must not be allowed to fail uh, that would cause uh, strategic business risk corporate viability in the in the business world we have a, a method uh, running scenarios that helps us tease those things out. Often the organization has a sense for what some of those things are, but because they've spent very little time thinking about how to kill themselves, uh, they haven't uh, gone to the level of depth that we, we help them get to and flesh that out. Uh, then we take it through uh, a mapping of the entire digital ecosystem that supports those functions, not the whole enterprise, not every endpoint, not every network or application, but the things that support those most critical cannot be allowed to fail functions and processes. That's phase two. Phase three, this is something Sarah is particularly adept at, is uh, targeting. Uh, how to craft using uh, ICS or other cyber kill chains, how to get uh, through that landscape to ultimately create the payload uh, that causes the unacceptable effect uh, that we're all trying to avoid. Um, we usually rack and stack those by how easy they are, that choreography to how to create that catastrophic uh, effect, sabotage, if you will, um, how confident you are, and um, how many steps it requires. Phase four is the last one. Uh, it's called mitigations and protections. And here, like I said at the beginning, is uh, where we turn first to engineering first principles, you know, things that we've used to build bridges, roads, and buildings for centuries based on physics. Uh, and uh, I think we'll get to it shortly, but we have a fairly topical example to help flesh this out using that uh, unfortunate uh, water utility in Florida. We'll get to that, I think. Uh, and that's great. And I, and I really like that phrase, think like an adversary, act like an engineer. But, you know, you and I have talked that this isn't only um, for engineers and, and operators, the whole concept of, of CCE. So why is it actually, Andy, why is it critical for a wider range of, of stakeholders to understand this solution? And what conversations do you want to be occurring at the board level in the C-suite to get them in the mindset of, you know, this is a way to mitigate some of the largest vulnerabilities that they're going to be facing as we go forward. Yeah, those poor folks uh, at the board level and uh, the, the senior executives and all, uh, whose day job is not cybersecurity, it's to, to run, a, run a successful business uh, and uh, ideally grow it. Um, they uh, typically will have, in 2021, they now have a senior person in charge of cybersecurity, in my opinion, ideally uh, IT and OT, cyber and physical, and they usually lump in compliance too. Uh, and they're hoping, they're really hoping that that person's doing a great job. Uh, but it's such a hard thing. It's a hard thing to know whether you have enough of the right kinds of security, whether you're ever making any mistakes that are leaving uh, doors open for adversaries. Uh, the thing that we can talk to those folks, and I also think of folks at that level as being similar to their, their peers, if you will, on the Hill, the, uh, the members in the House and Senate and their staff too, right? Um, again, such an abstract concept. CCE is a way of making something that's so ineffable, much more tangible. Um, there, just, if you show what the mitigation is that protects the large turbine from killing itself, if it's instructed to do so by digital means, if you show blueprints for how you've sized certain vessels that are holding caustic materials that could cripple your business if they were ever released all at once uh, by destroying long lead time to replace capital equipment, 
if you look at these diagrams, we can just use what we've known, what we've learned as a civilization to say that even if this thing was uh, told to kill itself, your cyber insurance isn't going to help with this, by the way, typically. Uh, it's going to get into the realm of your catastrophic loss, uh, property loss types of stuff. Then um, folks can have a lot more confidence that they are, uh, they are as protected as they, they hope they are. Uh, they hope that their cybersecurity program is protecting them. And one quick uh, add-on, please, uh, please know we are not advocating for stopping doing what folks are already doing in terms of the, the book describes it as cyber hygiene, but by that we mean the sum total of all the activities, all the products they bought and deployed, all the training they put themselves through, all the expert consultants that they hire and outsourced security providers. Um, please keep doing that to the very best of your ability. It's just we're saying at the end of the day, there are certain types of adversaries that um, can find their way through those things. And if they do and when they do, uh, there are some things you can now do to make sure that the very worst things don't happen. Yeah, no, that, that, that's great. And actually one of the quotes on the back of your book is from Tom Fanning, um, who is CEO of Southern Company. He sits with me as a, as a commissioner on the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. And um, I, I love what he wrote. He said, at its core, CCE is really about keeping operations going no matter what adversary nations or hostile groups have up their sleeves. Right, so that's at this kind of the strategic board C-suite, you know, level of of thinking that then can, can get those others in the in the company um, to to really take these steps. Absolutely. So, Andrew, Andrew, let's um let let's turn from the concept to reality. And you were one of the earliest adopters of CCE while you were at a very large U.S. based water authority. Um, what made you latch on to this solution and how did you convince your colleagues of the necessity and the utility of the solution? Um, so for us, uh, I mean, we always worried about the control system and its security, but, but after the release of information about Stuxnet and in, in particular, uh, uh, a presentation by Ralph Langer, um, sort of on the details, it was like, it was very clear that we, you know, even though we were trying to do a good job with cybersecurity, we weren't going to stop somebody who was talented or determined. And um, so then we started um, looking at it in terms of, you know, what what could go terribly wrong um, by somebody breaking in. And we'd had, you know, we, we'd looked at that just in terms of like operator errors and things before, but but never from a point of view of cybersecurity, somebody intentionally doing damage. And um, so in, in, in 2013, we had put together just a very small task order contract uh, to have to protect um, some pipes from getting overpressurized by having too many pumps come on. And, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't like obvious to the person who needed to approve that. Um, and so it just sort of languished for a little while. And then the, the uh, next year, there was a, a talk by Jason Larson that kind of reinforced the, you know, the possibility of somebody attacking with uh, bad intent and possibly damaging your infrastructure. So that like the critical aspects, processes that Andy was talking about. And so then that led us to do some internal system modeling that we could justify what we were saying. And then that was implemented through a capital contract and then subsequently installed at other pump stations um, by in-house staff. So it was, it, was, it was sort of worrying, sort of a, a baseline worrying that took a big jump up when it was clear that, you know, the cyber hygiene and all the good things you can do just wasn't going to be quite enough. Yeah, that's that's great. It's it's so thoughtful because it's you know it's just easy to say we'll just do business as usual, even when business as usual is completely failing um, in terms of uh, mitigating vulnerabilities. So to kind of break with the past and say we have to think about this problem differently if we're going to face this different kind of battle space um, that is really heating up. Uh, so, you know, really, really fantastic, fantastic work. Andy, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say there's a, a phrase that we use uh, in public and also in the book that's uh, 
basically says uh, it's not a good idea to rely on hope and hygiene. <laughs> hope and hygiene. Hygiene, again, being the sum total of everything you're doing now. And then I just hope that, that on my watch that they don't come calling for us, right? Uh, I learned in earlier business classes that uh, hope is not a strategy. And so uh, this is something more concrete, uh, something that you could um, sleep more soundly with. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and again, what's hitting the press in terms of, um, uh, you know, attacks on our critical infrastructure um, should actually be keeping more people, more people awake. Uh, so Andrew, on that note, let me, let me follow up with you because, um, you know, as I said, cyber vulnerabilities of the water sector and specifically are receiving front page coverage uh, following the attack of the water treatment facility in Oldsmar, Florida. So you might want to talk a little bit about that. But, um, you know, something that when we were talking the other day uh, and I heard you say was was really interesting and I think is going to be counterintuitive to many people listening to this panel, which is that the water sector actually has some advantages over the electricity sector when it comes to implementing cybersecurity um, solutions. So maybe take a few moments, um, uh, walk us through Oldsmar, and, and of course, if, if Sarah and Andy want to jump in on that discussion as well, but then also what you were, what you were schooling me on um, about some of the advantages in the water sector. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with that water versus electricity electric sector, just um, the water sector, uh, things happen much slower, <laughs> right? So you can have a pressure wave that's very fast, but generally everything you do is sort of paced and you're not, as a water utility, you're typically not connected to any other utilities, which is opposite of what's happening um, in the electric sector. And the electric sector has uh, ISOs and, and other, other groups that link everything together. And so it's, uh, you, it's an extra layer. Like if, if you're in a water utility, you can, you can do pretty well at isolating. Isolating doesn't mean you're free from somebody attacking you, but, it, but it's, it's one step in a, in a good direction. Um, what I just wanted to say, you know, the, the, the thing about the CCE that I think is really great is <clears throat> in particular, like the, the phase one where Andy was talking about identify those critical processes. And then the phase four is coming up with so physical solutions that can protect your, your process if somebody breaks in, or at the same time, if an operator makes an error or something else goes wrong, it's protecting your process. And, and those two aspects, you don't have to be like a cybersecurity wizard. You can be the engineer, you can be a maintenance person. There are all sorts of people in a water utility that can, can successfully work on those two steps and make a real difference, which is really exciting. So you can have a small utility that comes up with a really great solution on its own and, and they can keep doing those cyber hygiene items, but, but, but they have in house staff that are the experts on their process. So that's really cool. Um, jumping to the uh, uh, the Oldsmar case, um, that's um, that was interesting because um, you can so, so somebody just as a quick summary, somebody broke in and adjusted the sodium hydroxide level, the caustic to adjust the pH to, and 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 di you know essentially dialed up the level way high up to you know eleven thousand parts per million. And maybe the process couldn't even achieve that, but um, but the intent for damage was, you know, human damage was there, and it, it echoes something that happened in 2007 in um, Spencer, Massachusetts, where it was an it was an error, and it's a similar sized water system that um, accidentally released the, the uh, uh, sodium hydroxide. Um, over the course of the night, and then when their pump started up, it, it released it into the water system, and there were there were about a hundred people that had to go to the hospital with with you know from taking showers or physical burns, and uh, at least one person had to damage their esophagus, and so it was a scary thing. And in that phase four of the CCE, could you know help 
any utility and, and, and in that Oldsmar case, there are a few things that you could do to improve the resilience. And um, so one would be just having an independent monitoring system separate from your SCADA system. So you can get an alarm if the SCADA system's compromised, something else can give you alarm that there's a problem. You can do this, the, that engineering solution by having like a, a, a relay contact off of the pH transmitter. That's what's monitoring the level of the sodium hydroxide that will cut off the, those sodium hydroxide pumps if it's seen a level that's too high. So that, that can again be independent of the SCADA system. You could change the pump size. So, you know, the pumping, it's a funny, I don't want to go into too many details, but it's, it's a small amount like for, I don't know how much was released, actually could be released <clears throat> at Oldsmar, but in that Spencer case, it was only like 34 or so gallons. It's a small amount of liquid. And so you might be able to adjust, redesign the pump size so it's smaller or change the capacity of the container. You know, it all depends on how their pattern of treatment and, and flows to their tanks. Um, but anyway, it's, it's there, there are things that you can do to prevent that kind of water quality problem or physical damage to systems. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, and I want to turn to Andy. I think he wants to jump in a little bit on this. Um, and I know you were going into detail, but I actually, I don't mind and I don't think our listeners mind because in most of our cybersecurity discussions um, that we're having around Washington, the broader policy community, you know, we have to put our head in our hand because where do we even where do we even enter into the discussion to find any ways to mitigate? So the fact that you just kind of rattled off and we could do this and we could do this and there are things that can be done um, is 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 very hopeful in a discussion that often um, is not. So Andy, you wanted to uh, answer yeah, sure, just a couple of comments and I'll try to stay short. Uh, it's important to note that the things Andrew was listing there are often. Um, extremely affordable, which is a weird thing in cybersecurity where we think we have to go to the Moscone Center, uh, the pilgrimage every year to the RSA conference and find out what the new quantum blockchain solution is. It's gonna be expensive, but it'll keep you safe, you hope. Um, these things are so practical and, and easy for lay people to understand. It's really wonderful. The, the particular remark uh, that uh, triggered me was when, he, was when Andrew said, um, you don't need to be a cybersecurity expert on this stuff in, in many cases. In some cases you do, when we're at this, the serious national security level, some of the INL's projects, uh, you need uh, the whole shebang uh, of, the, of the methodology and connected to the Intel community and all that. But um, for many uh, companies, especially smaller and mid-sized ones that just don't have the resources of the big guys, um, I almost wish that the term didn't have the word cyber in it. It scares people when it makes them think of all that other stuff uh, it would be better if it was just engineering that protects you from catastrophes. Uh, the cyber enabled part is there simply because that's how they're going to get to you. Uh, but once you get past that, sure. it, there's things you can do that really don't require much background in that domain. Um, so Andy, you mentioned the words national security. So I want to turn to you, Sarah, um, and talk about what happened in, in Ukraine a, a few years ago when the Russian hackers attacked the electric grid. And, you know, look, we, we know that the Russians have tried to penetrate American um, utilities. So, you know, thinking back on, on Ukraine and maybe, you know, give some high level points, because I know you were very involved in kind of the mitigation afterwards. Um, but how, how would the CCE kind of thinking through um, help protect uh, against a repeat of, of what happened in, in Ukraine? Of course. Um, so in December 2015, and then again in December of 2016, there were a couple of incidents where um, externally uh, enabled cyber actors uh, accessed machines and systems that have been put in place specifically for normal operations. This is probably a trend that we've seen more and more of. Um, I, everybody, I, usually in these conversations, Stuxnet comes up, but a lot has changed since Stuxnet, so not everything looks like that. Not this concept of an independently enabled piece of malware that gets inserted and then and wreaks havoc. In this case, you had external parties connecting through, in the first case, you know, HMIs uh, through VPNs, through normal infrastructure, and then having access to that stuff, 
operated the system as intended. So in this particular case, they were opening breakers at the first time and, and it resulted in a loss of power to something like 225,000 end nodes. Um, the customer numbers are hard to get because a specific end node might result in um, more than one person losing power at their residence, that kind of thing, especially if it's an apartment building. So the numbers are high. And then we saw a similar activity occur in, uh, in 2016, but this time at a, a transmission level substation. So um, it does, in that case, there were a few things that came out of it. Uh, I think for a lot of people, it was a real showstopper. It was really uh, a surprising event in a number of ways. I know at Idaho, uh, we were actually very, we had to stop and, and take stock again, doing a lot of cyber threat intelligence work. We'd fallen into the trap of evaluating things based on their level of sophistication. There were sophisticated aspects to that attack. Um, there was a lot of coordination that went in. There was a fair amount of pre-planning, but the actual movements themselves, what the attack operators were performing was amongst the most basic of activities. They were using the system against itself and they did so intelligently, but this wasn't a master criminal cyber activity. And it's interesting because a lot of people want to fall into that trap, that almost that fear, uncertainty and doubt, but it's really important that we have a, a realistic spectrum so that we know when something is, is, is truly devastating and we really do need to bring everybody together very quickly. Uh, in terms of CCE, and in fact, after we went to Ukraine uh, in May 2016, one of the things we talked a lot about with the, the energy entities over there was proper responses, <laughs> because in that, in that circumstance, I think everyone was equally shocked and there were certain things that happened that could have happened more quickly in order to limit that, that impact. In fact, in one of the cases, one of the distribution entities uh, I don't, they felt empowered enough to just disconnect the, the energy management system, the distribution management system. And in doing so, they took away the pathway the attackers were using to manipulate uh, and, and control those points. So when you're talking about CCE, part of it is knowing yourself. And an example like 2015 and 2016 really illustrates what, what your, your stated function is, your mission goals and those kinds of things, and then how it can be used against you. Um, but I think that I think that for for most people, what we're trying to get at here is is not having that failure of imagination. So especially in the in the first phase of CCE, we're really trying to look at how the system can be manipulated. And so examples like that are just very helpful for moving the conversation along. There are challenges if you look at um, how you move beyond that. So if you want to say, I want to put in uh, protections and mitigation specifically relevant to that, obviously we did a lot of work um, both in Ukraine and the United States to make that more um, feasible. I mean, obviously the first thing, like I said, was kind of this education. This is in the realm of the possible. How would your people respond? And, uh, you know, do, uh, do they feel empowered to make these critical decisions that change how the control system is interacting with the environment? Um, but even beyond that, sometimes it's a little bit challenging. In the Ukrainian case, for example, their recovery actions were very manual. Um, they didn't trust their systems. They couldn't guarantee that they'd properly cast out the attackers from those environments. So rather than operate uh, potentially contaminated networks, they chose to operate at a degraded state for many, many, many months. Uh, in the United States, that's that's probably not an option for us, unfortunately. We have adopted higher degrees of automation and, and we don't necessarily have the manpower to, to take that on. But being able to say quickly island operations so that you can't necessarily have an impact um, that's as wide scale, looking at balancing authorities and the resiliency across the electric grid, that's all things that can be done. Um, there are obviously also technical things we can put in place in terms of how many uh, virtual private network points can connect to your system at any given time. That would also challenge this, at least in, in the manifestation we saw in, in 2015, uh, because there's, there's um, you know, there was a lot of activity that was going on really quickly and it was clearly malicious. So putting in place, you know, fall gaps that say, oh, this is too many, or you've exceeded the number of connection points, that's all stuff we would also encourage people to do. Mm -hmm. Um, but the real problem here, and I think this is where I kind of said this already, but CCE isn't necessarily about looking at a past example or a past attack and trying to mitigate it against it. If we can do that, but that's kind of what we were already doing. There's lots of entities that'll tell you immediately after an attack how to better protect yourself, best practices. 
um, you know, things you should do to make sure that you're not as at risk for those kinds of things. CCE is about predicting the next attack. Um, and so that's that's part of the reason why it has this combination of threat intelligence, why it brings in the engineers, because as Andrew said so elegantly, nobody, even the attackers, do not understand these systems to the degree that the engineers that built them. And so part of the, the defensive uh, advantage is bringing those people into the room. There's a fair number of engineers who actually, for whatever reason, have already thought about what the worst case scenario would be on their systems because they've looked at them day in and day out. If you can identify those people in your organization, it's invaluable to hear how they think that uh, their system would be destroyed. Then if you can take those that are perhaps right on the fence, um, but show them what, what an adversary attack planning thing looks like, understanding how they get into your system, how they manipulate certain points, how they learn what your weaknesses are, uh, and you can change their perspective, then you've duplicated the number of people that we we like to say have the evil bit. So you use the the evil bit for good, but but that perspective, however we can get there, that's that's the core part of CCE. Yeah, that that is fantastic. And that that's also, you know, just what you talked about um, at uh, the Center for Cyber and Technology Innovation, um, which is hosting this panel. That, that's why we were so excited to learn about this because at CCTI, we kind of take on the human elements that are preventing um, you know, people, corporations, parts of the US government from adopting best practices, right? That fear, doubt, and uncertainty. You know, what, what, is, what is it? Lack of authorities, lack of resources, lack of, I don't know what this is and it scares me that I'm gonna bring the internet, whatever it is, um, we try to kind of get underneath that um, to kind of open a space for, for folks like you and, and the important work of CCE to kind of walk through. Um, Andy, I know you wanted to um, uh, make uh, a Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, just so, as uh, the, the tail end of uh, Sarah's description and then your pivot into the human element at FDD. Um, while CCE is entirely science-based, the description of taking somebody who's on the fence and they're like, I don't know if anybody could really hurt us and then showing them, yep, yep, they really could. There's a bit of a religious conversion that happens there. And uh, once those people are converted, they become some of the best advocates for then following through to the very, to the very end. In the descriptions of uh, Ukrainian incidents, Sarah gave also, you know, I bet somewhere in the audience viewing, viewing this uh, conversation, there's somebody who's a pretty advanced technical thinker. They know the way grids work, the way transformers work, and they're a little bit unsatisfied that I wish these guys could have been a little bit more technical. They really watered it down too much. I invite you, and it sounds like promotion, it is a little bit, but I'll keep it moderate. If you go to the appendix of the Countering Cyber Sabotage book on CCE, there's a, a case study on a fictional uh, central to Eastern European country called Baltavia. I just wanna say right up front, it's, it's Baltavia, it's not Ukraine. It's completely not Ukraine. Uh, but it should satisfy the most ardent technical person. Uh, it should scratch those itches. It's almost unreadable by anyone else. But for certain people, uh, it really communicates uh, how CCE works against these top tier uh, threats uh, in exquisite detail. Um, I wanna get, oh yeah, please, Andrew. Um, yeah, just adding, <laughs> adding on to uh, Sarah and Andy. Um, you know, as Sarah was saying, you know, the Ukraine attack had some basic elements and, and, the, and the things we're seeing in the water sector are super basic. It's just remote access. And, um, and so it's, you know, lots of utilities are vulnerable. And, uh, and one thing that every utility can do uh, that's really useful is to think through the manual steps for their operation. And they may not be able to completely do the whole process, you know, the, the pressurization and the treatment may not be able to do everything, but if you can at least do the, the pressurization so that firefighting can happen, um, work that out and then take the time because there'll be ways to uh, adjust your process and it may take some effort, but you, you know, eventually you can come up with a way to man, you know, in quotes manually, because you may have separate control elements that are independent that help you run your system. If your SCADA system's breached, you want to you turn that off and disconnect and run manually. So every utility can think through that 
with those, you know, in-house experts. And, and in this case, you know, they'll need some help from some process control people to think through it. Um, but that's important. And then just one last thing was um, in um, 2018, I think Andy did a, Andy published a, a piece in the, in the Harvard Business Review, which was really helpful for us because it, it, it got our, our uh, executive office attention because it was something, you know, it was it, it was the right language and and it, and it and it made it clear that what we were doing was not like like off the wall kind of stuff. It just made sense. Um, and and out of that article, we then went back to look for other issues. And and the the, the first part of that process was bringing in the maintenance, the engineers, everybody who had a stake in the process working. You know, you know, regulatory, every aspect, and then it was a case of, you, you know, forget that we have any security. Just assume that a bad guy can do anything they want. You know, don't don't limit yourself. Just imagine the worst things, the things that you worry about at night, just happening, and then we can come up with that list, and then try to come up with. Uh, ways to per, protect your system and, and and you know we're used to calling it cyber physical safety system so it's you know as a safety system other other groups of people can appreciate you know that and think you know oh yeah that makes sense we want to you know maybe we're not protecting or maybe we're protecting the customers but but, but but sort of first we're protecting the process and the equipment I just yeah. want to say when when is pardon the interrupt, uh, Samantha, but when uh, you were describing figuring out how you can run less optimally, but still keep things going uh, with manual and semi-manual modes, live to play another day. There's a beautiful textbook uh, uh, description of resilience, uh, the ability to operate through. And uh, I know the, uh, the Cyberspace Solarium Commission uh, advocates for this, and uh, it's it's just the best way to think when we're dealing with these with these topics, which can which can seem overwhelming. That's right. It, uh, we did take it on in in uh, Solarium as as one of the key planks in deterrence. If the adversary knows that you can actually um, fight another day. Um, that you are not going to be down for the count and completely out of the game um, after an attack, it gives them pause uh, that they will be able to reach their goals by some type of, of massive attack. Um, I want to get back to this conversation about um, the human in or out of the loop. And so, Sarah, one, one of um, one part of CC that I that I really do find interesting is is of course the idea that this keeping a human out of the loop. Um, actually has significant downsides. Um, and across industry, there's an increasing embrace of automation and, and remote connection and, you know, as a, a cost savings mechanism in, in our own CCTI discussions with small water utilities, you know, that's, that's the way they say we have to survive. We don't have many resources. We have to get at this, you know, very reasonably cheap, whatever price um, widget and, and fire lots of people instead. Um, so, and companies also, they tout the efficiency of all digital systems and the removal, as if the removal of all human error. Um, but CC takes a different approach. So, so walk us through this. Of course. Yeah, CC does recognize that in some cases uh, there's reasons why market or otherwise, there's been constraints on the environment. Organizations have adopted automation. Um, we're kind of neutral on the topic. I think that that's where the market has gone. And I don't think we're going to get rid of that, but there is value in having a human in the loop. We talk a lot about examples, specific examples where the human is sitting there in front of uh, the screen, kind of like in the old smart case, there's other incidences that have that kind of option, but sometimes the human in the loop is, you know, it could be someone that's not sitting there in real time. So depending on how you insert that perspective, what we're really getting at though, is perhaps maybe we shouldn't make our digitized systems all powerful. So there's a limit to, you know, advantage there. Obviously you want to get all your financial returns in terms of automation and control. And in some cases it may make sense to automate but there are physical stop gaps that can be put in place in case there is manipulation or loss of control of the digitized system. 
that's something that I think it, it's been around for a few years. A, a lot of people, especially in the in the Beltway area, are familiar with Richard Danzig's "Surviving a Diet Poison Fruit." But it's that concept of engineering in resiliency more than engineering out humans. So you might want to engineer a human in back into the loop if that's if that's your resiliency plan. But the other part of it is is recognizing that that there it you know just like the human, it, you know they may be there may be an insider threat. They may be the savior. Just like that, your digitized system may also be both a threat and a help to you. So um, recognizing that's a, a neutral concept, it could be used either way for good or for evil. Maybe we should constrain what the full power and uh, capability of those systems are. Oh, Andrew? I just, uh, to, to, you can have, I mean, one, one way to look at it maybe is, you know, the digitized system's really important for all sorts of industries, but you can, um, you can design it or customize it after it's already in place in a way that the critical components, and that might be your, 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 your control elements, like the, the pumps or whatever's at the end, or a, a, like a, some, a skid mounted process, you know, like in water, it might be UV or ozone or something. You can wire that in, in a way that it's not on your network. You can have a, you know, a four to 20 milliamp connection. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not like a smart communication. It's just passing data that you can't, you know, you can manipulate it, but, but, but it's something that you can't attack in a traditional way. And so you can save those components for when your SCADA system goes down in your manual or semi-manual process. You, you're, you're protecting that equipment um, along the way, even though it's a digital, con, you know, it's a control system automated, but you can hybridize it to, to preserve really important parts. Great. Um, Andy. I, I, uh, I want to get to, I think, uh, one of the um, uh, most telling or most colorful or most impactful examples um, in, in the book about the importance of keeping a human in the loop. Um, and uh, you, you call out Stanislav Petrov, um, the Soviet lieutenant colonel who, as you say, may have saved the world um, in 1983. So, you know, t tell us a little bit about that story, um, as well as you know how how that actually made you think um, about incorporating some of the principles from that. Um, sure, NCC. sure. Thanks, Samantha. Yeah, for those of you who don't know it, if you were born after 1983, you almost were never born, and if uh, you were alive at that time, you, you would have had a very bad evening. Um, in uh, around midnight. Uh, the, um, in the Soviet, then Soviet Union equivalent of NORAD, they just stood up a very complex computerized system uh, to track inbound ICBMs. And um, Stanislav Petrov, a lieutenant commander, not the highest ranking person in the control room by any means, uh, but the chief architect of the system, was on station that night when all of a sudden everything went off. Just picture... Uh, sirens, klaxons, lights flashing, uh, ultimate red alert, like on Star Trek. And um, their job, they first they did a query to the system and said, because uh, there was a way to sort of gauge the degree of confidence. And uh, the system came back and said, uh, hi, highest confidence, this is for real. That just made the humans, again, the human element, right? that just made the humans just even more frantic and nervous. And they were on the verge of calling the Kremlin, calling the, the government leadership and saying, we need authorization to launch all of our missiles at the United States. And so um, Petrov was there though, and he knew this was not a perfect system as there is no perfect system, but he really knew that in a way nobody else in the room did. And he, he pleaded uh, to the higher ranking people there to please uh, let's wait till we get some uh, corroborating or orthogonal other data from our other sensors, other humans uh, around the world uh, before we go call the Kremlin. And they did wait. 
And uh, the other folks chimed in from around the world and said, we don't, we don't see anything. It's nothing, nothing's going on from here. And then everybody could breathe again and exhale and uh, bring the system down. They did forensics later on and figured out what had happened. But yeah, I have to understand that if that, that particular person, uh, the, we think in the book we call him the ultimate man in the loop, if he hadn't been there, uh, they would have launched and then we would have launched and then it would all be over. Uh, now, that's about as dramatic as you can possibly get. And you might be saying, well, you know, our business isn't about the end of the world. We're just a international cheese manufacturing company, for example. Still, if that's your livelihood, if that's how you make your own living and your employees and your customers uh, are loyal to you, it's kind of like the end of your world if that all goes crumbling, all goes tumbling down. Uh, so that when, when Sarah was remarking on it uh, and others, sometimes for some things, it is worth it to pay a salary of a person, a trust person you trust who has knowledge. And uh, they don't always have to be in the room, but uh, to be parts of the most critical parts of the process to have an eye on those things, uh, you can imagine that could pay for that salary um, many times over. And just a quick footnote, if I was writing, it would be a footnote. Uh, the documentary on Lieutenant Commander Stanislav Petrov is called The Man Who Saved the World. And so you can find it if you want to check it out. I, I recommend it. That's, uh, that's fantastic. He did. He really did. Yeah, that, that is fantastic. I know what I'll, I'll be watching tonight. Um, I, I mean, Andrew, or, or to, to any, um, maybe a last question before we you know, get into policy recommendations for a few minutes. Um, I, so FDD, CCTI, alongside of, of Idaho National Lab, um, sponsored by the Department of Energy, has created this OT, Operational Technology Defenders Fellowship. Um, and Andrew, um, you, you know, you have talked about the unique challenges that um, OT professionals face, uh, you know, when their systems are, you know, maybe being replaced every decade or so, where the IT professionals, you know, a, a new system is, is coming along uh, much more rapidly. And again, we're, we're speaking to a broad policy community um, on this panel, talking to folks on the Hill. Um, you know, what, what do they need to know about, you know, not just the differences between OT and IT, but, but, but the unique challenges that the OT um, workforce is facing along what, what we're talking about today, the, the, um, uh, the, the shape of the, the battle space. Um, so yeah, like you were saying, it's a, it's a time frame issue of, you know, so you, you have the, your treatment plant or your pump station, it's, it's set up with programmable logic controllers and they're programmed and they're in place. And they, they're very reliable pieces of equipment. So you don't wanna, you know, mess with them if you don't have to. And, uh, and, and they, they go out of their life cycle over, you know, decade, you know, two decades, or it's a long period of time before the company stops supporting that equipment. And so you're often not forced to spend, you know, what can be, you know, millions of dollars to upgrade um, for long stretches of time. And so that's kind of, as part of why CCE is really valuable, particularly the engineering the system for resilience, because it's, um, it's providing the protection that you might not be able to incorporate in the, the networked part of your control system, because the equipment's aging and you're, you're not able to replace it easily. Um, so having the safety systems or engineered controls or the manual operation plan, you know, for those fallbacks, it, it becomes much more important for, you know, versus the enterprise where maybe every five years they get a, a, a complete replacement of, of hardware and software. Let's let's turn to kind of broad policy recommendations, or you know how we get the concepts of CC to a broader um, uh, base of, of people that need to know and, and understand this. Um, so, uh, Andy, let, let me start with you. Sure, sure. Um, 
a couple of years ago, uh, first step uh, was made in this direction. It was before the uh, dawn of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, uh, but it was Senator Angus King, the eventual co-chair of said commission. Uh, and uh, in, in, my, in my opinion, one of the, one of the sm smartest people on cyber topics up on the Hill. Uh, he, in uh, conjunction with Senator Risch of Idaho, advocated for, took a while, uh, a, a, a piece of legislation called the Securing Energy, Securing Energy Infrastructure Act. And it said things that sort of uh, got the press a little bit riled up. Uh, one of the terms I know they focused on was uh, the selective reintroduction of analog technology. Uh, what? That's heresy. We believe in progress, not going back to the Stone Age. These, this bill would, would dumb down the smart grid. I'm not anti-press. That was one way you could interpret it. But that wasn't the intent of it, and that's not really what it's about. It's about things like considering putting a person back in the loop. It's about fail safes and stop gaps of a mechanical or physics based nature to save to save the day uh, when it really gets gets that intense. So I'd say to me that was the the first shot on the policy side uh, that that ties tightly into this. Uh, and then uh, again, the work of the Solarium Commission. Uh, in you know, I think there are 80 in the initial in the initial publication plus or minus and uh, a number of them speak to this, especially every time we get to resilience anywhere in that vicinity or continuity of the economy continuity of missions. We're talking about things protecting things that must not be allowed to fail and if they do fail, then having a plan B and a plan C. So that you can keep uh, keep keep operating through so that's. I think the commission has picked up the torch from Senator Angus King and Senator Resch and is carrying it through. A lot of what you could do in the future uh, would be, and I think again, these are in the recommendations, um, educating people, educating folks that, are, that live on the front lines of these most important critical infrastructure systems on some of these approaches. Uh, it doesn't have to be CCE exactly, uh, just to let them know that there's an alternative to uh, business as usual and Again, I'm not anti RSA conference or, or any vendor, uh, but if that's all we have, uh, we're gonna end up staying in this extremely uncertain position, uh, which is very uncomfortable for the foreseeable future. We do have, I think, a way out of that um, uh, at, at our disposal now. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Solarium, we have been empowered for another year. So um, we are gonna be keep pushing these, these uh, critical and important issues. Um, Andrew, uh, maybe some thoughts on, on what the folks in Washington should be focused on? Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would say for on the water industry, if, if, if you can, um, I, mean, I don't know, requires the right word, but you, you, it'd be really excellent if every water utility had that manual fallback plan to whatever level they can achieve but that it's documented and practiced um so you can maintain whatever level of service because you you know kind of like what andy's saying you you know right now there's not a way to protect yourself in the cyber world and so you you need that fallback that resilience um so that would that would be it and 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 take advantage of the the staff the engineers the maintenance people to come up with those protective measures uh that can kick in if either by an operator error or a cyber, you know, person, you know, a, a adversary attacking um, and trying to cause mischief. Um, so um, those are those are two things. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Sarah, I think I'll I'll give you the the last word on policy reflections, but also um, other things that we we may have missed in this discussion. Thank you. Uh, I I don't often get the last word, but there we. Go. Yeah. Um, I think one of the key things to keep in mind, we, we talked about this a little bit, but we didn't clearly state it. I do do a lot of work um, focused on threat capabilities, threat actor growth. Um, but I think the we tend to look at that in a vacuum and, and not recognize the other actions that are going on. If we look on, on the other side, on the defender side, there's, there's market forces, there's other things that are happening that I think policy can be directed against. 
uh, at Idaho National Laboratory, we usually call these out as increased digitization, which we have talked a lot about, but also increased um, integration. Those two go hand in hand. Uh, the, the fact that there is actually a shrinking market space in many critical infrastructure sectors. So the, there's a small group of vendors from a targeting standpoint, from the adversary's perspective, that makes it a lot easier to develop capabilities. Um, and then ultimately, we do have a lot of engineers who uh, learned a different type of engineering in some ways, and they're retiring. Um, and and they were retiring in part because we've we replaced some of them with automated systems. But but those pieces should probably each be addressed in their own ways. Um, one of the things that comes to mind, for example, especially given INL's nuclear background, we talk a lot. That's that's a very much a shrinking industry. It's really hard to teach a nuclear engineer the same way that perhaps we taught them decades ago because they're not necessarily in a position to build new nuclear power plants and new control systems from scratch. Um, and that, that's something that as a policy, I think it's really important to push for that innovation. We talk a lot about educating the workforce and, and that's important, but I think part of the key part of that education is actually allowing room for some of that innovation. And that's going to require um, a lot of I guess, um, some investment, but also the willingness to allow people to experiment and try new things. On the, the shrinking of the market space, uh, obviously that's a lot more complicated of an issue. It, it's a globalized economy in terms of the digital goods, um, in terms of where we come from, uh, where our stuff comes from. You've heard a lot about it, knowing thyself lately, especially with things like software bill of materials, hardware bill of materials, that's a great place to start. I think that the reality is we've probably gone really far into the in down that path where it's really difficult at this point to um, start producing a lot of those materials inside the United States. So uh, from an engineering standpoint, what we want to encourage is that people recognize that that diet of poison fruit concept again, and we start um, developing mechanisms that allow these systems to operate, even if subcomponents within them are, are potentially compromised from a supply chain standpoint. And then finally, if there is a preference for specific market vendors, um, the market to economy on the world stage is, is complicated by a certain degree of subsidization that goes into from, for certain vendors. So if we do want a preference for particular companies, particular technologies, we, we may have to consider subsidizing those particular uh, technological solutions. Thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, all three of you. This was a fantastic session and, and I actually can't wait to listen to it again because you know when you're moderating, you're moderating, you're not always be able to focus on, on all of the really uh, fantastic recommendations. Um, that came out of out of this panel, um, and uh, you know, in, in as we had talked about, it's oftentimes a very dark discussion. Um, but in a way, I felt this this conversation was comforting because there is a process um, that we can follow and learn from to help our resilience, help our our country's resilience. Um, so it it on this Friday it leaves us uh, hopeful. Um, Again, thank you. I can't thank you enough. Um, and for those of you listening who haven't yet read the book, I, I highly recommend it. Um, I'm not sure who's going to play Andy and Sarah in the movie version, but um, uh, stay tuned. We'll, we'll get to that at a different point. But again, thank you. Thank you very much.